Ok, caro Gabriele, dovremmo essere in diretta, quindi eh, siamo in diretta in un orario un po' strano, ma io passo immediatamente all'inglese, se siete d'accordo. So, uh, hello everyone, uh, we are live now. This is not our usual uh, um, timeline, because uh, usually we go live uh, uh, in the evening, but today we have an international guest, Uh, you can see her uh, immediately because uh, uh, she is visible. Um, she is Deborah Lapton, one of the editors of this uh, book, The Face Mask in COVID Times, a Social Material Analysis, uh, published by De Groyter uh, in uh, 2021. It's a uh, really recent book, of course, because um, uh, the topic is recent too, unfortunately. Um, the book is edited by uh, Deborah but also by Clara Southerton, Marianne Clark, and Ash Watson. Um, we have also, Gabriele, today a special discussant, uh, uh, Marco Viola. Uh, you can see him with his uh, uh, wonderful mask <laughs> uh, on his face, uh, because Marco is here as a representative of um, uh, facets, because, of course, we are talking about uh, masks. So um, we thought it was good to uh, insert this uh, special episode into uh, the, proce the project we are working on um, in, the, in this period. Uh, I will, as always, give just a brief summary of this book, which is a, a not so long book, but quite interesting, because, of course, the object, the argument is uh, uh, an argument uh, globally widespread and uh, everybody has to uh, has to do with <laughs> with uh, this strange thing uh, that is the the phase uh, uh, sanitary mask and it is interesting to notice that uh, the approach uh, is an interdisciplinary approach because uh, we have a co of course a sociological perspective i'd say mixed with uh, um cultural studies, because in the book, uh, the cultural problems related uh, to bodies, genders, minorities, and masks are pretty well uh, uh, emphasized and underlined. But of course, uh, 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 face masks uh, configure a material problem. They are objects, uh, they are artifacts, uh, they are made with certain uh, uh, materials. And so one of the main uh, core business of the book is how to put together this materiality with the cultural, sociological uh, uh, things related to this materiality. So uh, the book is uh, um, divided into a, a series of uh, uh, macro uh, chapters, um, which uh, um, put in comparison, as I said, in comparison, as I said, uh, the social materialism related to the mask, but also all the political issues uh, uh, which are involved, implied by this new way to uh, inhabit uh, uh, our new reshaped society after uh, the pandemic. Um, there is also, and I think it's quite interesting, uh, um, a kind of uh, analysis about a new semantic configuration of the briefing. So, What does it mean to uh, brief uh, uh, with the mask on and how uh, this thing is uh, intertwined with other political issues? For example, the uh, very sad and well-known uh, phrase, I can't brief, a phrase we, we all uh, know uh, because of the uh, things happened in the United States uh, in 2020. Um, and of course, as I said, All the also quite uh, nice, quite uh, funny, but uh, uh, relevating uh, um, issues related to the crafting uh, of the masks. So the homemade uh, um, masks, uh, uh, the artisan mask, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, the common ground of this book, uh, I think one of the common grounds of this book, uh, I think is the um, idea of the care. What is the care and how can we understand the, the care, uh, the care 
uh, nowadays. I don't want to go further because it was just a brief introduction. Of course, uh, as um, maybe we didn't say, but uh, um, today is a kind of express episode, so we have one hour. So probably we won't have time to go uh, deeper into all the arguments touched by this book but uh, we will do our best. I immediately give the floor to Gabriele in order to introduce uh, our guest and the editors of the book, and then we go uh, freely into our discussion. So thank you, Bruno. Uh, I would like to, to say thank you uh, so much to Debra, who accepted our invitation, um, because the, the, this book is uh, really in, in overlap with our uh, topic subject of interest in uh, in the, the project uh, facets and uh, for us as semioticians and philosophers it is interesting to uh, compare uh, methodologies and approaches so uh, I think that this is a very um, um, it is a very good example of how on topics such as these uh, we can we can share experiences and methodologies and data so uh, I, I will give the floor to, to Deborah, but I just wanted to, to introduce her uh, a little bit for, other, for our audience. Uh, Deborah is a, a sharp professor in the Center for Social Research in Health and the Social Policy uh, Research Center um, at the University of uh, New South Wales at Sydney. And she is the, the head, the leader of the Vitalities Lab, um, which is a sociological, and mediological, and, and uh, cultural uh, research center of study. Um, she did a lot of things, uh, and so I, I will be really uh, quick in the presentation, but I wanted to underline that uh, um, she's uh, really uh, keen on the idea of studying how, uh, whether, and to which extent uh, is it possible uh, from an ethical perspective to put together uh, automated decision making and society uh, so uh, automated decision making policies and uh, how we uh, uh, make it make it possible for society to go on and develop in a uh, ethical in an ethical way um, she runs a, a very interesting blog in sociology which is called the sociological life and uh, as Bruno was uh, was mentioning, uh, she's not the only author of this book. I, I will just uh, quickly address also the, the other uh, authors and curators who are Marianne Clark, uh, Claire Satterton and Ash Watson. They are, all the three of them are postdoctoral um, fellow at the very same lab and uh, research center at the very same university. So they are a research group um, and they deal uh, with um, issues converging in this paradigm that actually I was not aware of because uh, I'm ignorant of a lot of things, but uh, so I was not aware that uh, social materialism was a, a paradigm. And so I'm really curious to, to talk about that. And they converge on this paradigm, which is very interesting for semiotics. And now we are going to say why um, from very different perspectives, but they are um, uh, converging. So gender and health, for example, intimacy and sexuality. And then also there is a kind of pinch of uh, sociological fiction because one of the author, uh, Ash, uh, is specialized in this field. So I think it's kind of theory fiction in a sociological perspective, which is something that here in Italy we do not have. So we have to learn a lot of things. I will conclude just by saying that, uh, yes, uh, social materialism is the paradigm uh, within which the book is framed. And for us as semiotician, that is interesting because we share some roots, we share some uh, origins, because uh, obviously, for example, uh, Foucault uh, and his biopolitics are one important source to this approach that, as Bruno was saying, tries to put together how things are not just things, but rather subjects, active subject, subjects, and in semiotics, we have this theory that was popularized in uh, uh, Anglophone countries by Bruno Latour, the actor network theory, which is very similar to the idea that we share the very same environment with objects, we make sense of them, and they are with us as other active subjects. So I will shut up. I will say again, thanks a lot to Deborah 
for joining us. And I, I will just ask to, to her um, if she, if can she tell us more about this perspective, its roots, uh, and how you got from sociology and media and cultural studies into this paradigm. So thanks a lot. Yes, sure. I would be happy to talk about those issues. So maybe it might be useful to give a bit of my background, my intellectual background. So I actually was very much a Foucauldian scholar um, in my early career. And um, I was trained in sociology and biological anthropology, actually. Um, so there was quite an emphasis on human biology in my undergraduate training as well as in the social and cultural aspects of everyday life and everyday practices. I became very interested in sociology of health as well as an undergraduate. Then um, I went on to do a Master of Public Health degree and that was really interesting for someone trained in sociology. It was also around the time that Foucauldian theory was really starting to have an impact in the Anglophone world. We're talking about the late 1980s um, and into the early 1990s um, when his work started to appear in translation, particularly his histories of sexuality, the different volumes involved there, and later on his work on governmentality and um, biopolitics and the care of the self became really influential, particularly in the sociology of health in Anglophone context, in Australia, in, in the UK, less so in the USA because medical sociology there tends to be less theoretical and more quantitative than in Australia and the UK, but also in Northern Europe, very much so in those people who were writing and researching in English and publishing in English. So Codian theory is very much the, the go-to uh, for those of us interested in the social cultural aspects, political aspects of health and medicine from the late 80s. So I did this very applied master's degree in public health and I was there as one of the few people who had social science and even sort of theoretical social theory training, it was mostly medical doctors and those kinds of people who were studying the master's degree. I actually thought I would go into applied public health at that point, that's why I did that degree. But it was really interesting to, to be sort of there in the thick of it, to be a participant observer of how public health officials and practitioners are trained. I mean, I learnt epidemiology and biostatistics and health promotion and models of health behaviour and health economics, all those aspects. And I actually couldn't believe just how individualistic and a theoretical and quantitative and uncritical all these approaches to public health and people's behaviours around health were as someone who had been trained in sociology and anthropology. So I actually stayed on in that. It was in a faculty of medicine, a department of public health. So I stayed on in that department and did my PhD on HIV AIDS and the way that HIV AIDS was reported in the Australian press using a very Foucauldian discourse analysis of the press reports, um, looking at language use, at discourse, at image use. So it was, you know, pretty much bordering on a semiotic analysis because I did look at, at language and discourse and also imagery, you know, the way that headlines were configured in the news articles, the news actors who were represented in positive and negative ways. And of course, there was much there to say about stigmatised and marginalised groups around the HIV AIDS epidemic. So I already had that real interest in, in media, as well as in sociology, as well as in Foucauldian theory, and I was bringing all those things together in my doctorate. Um, then I went on and uh, became an academic and pursue, kept pursuing sociology of health and a lot of my research, but I also became interested in the sociology of digital media because around that time too, we're now talking the the mid 90s, there was, you know, the uh, personal computing was becoming dominant in people's everyday lives. Not, not yet the internet, but personal computers sitting on people's desks, incorporated into scholarly work. Uh, the early email system had begun to develop then, and um, we were talking about computer viruses, and I became quite interested in that. 
the semiotics of computer viruses and the way that we the way that this human embodied metaphor was being used to talk about personal computers. So I started writing a sort of cultural analyses of the way that we think about our relationships with computers um, and the sort of medicalized way and pathologized ways that we, we think about um, our bodies and about computer sort of slash bodies and our interactions and um, um, kind of our identities and and those sorts of practices around computer technologies so so long story short i've always been interested in embodiment i've always been interested in the way that language and discourse is used and imagery is used but also material things come together as entanglements of ways of configuring concepts of selfhood and subjectivity and identity and embodiment so that so we're talking really about decades now of, of really me having that that interest so when the um, when I started reading I have read you know I obviously did read Latour's work when he when active network theory and and Latourian theory became became more um, dominant in anglophone social theory but what I've become more recently interested in is in the feminist new materialist philosophers people like Rosie Bray Jane Bennett, who's an American political scientist. I've always read uh, Donna Haraway's work ever since, you know, her cyborg manifesto had such an impact, um, which was published in the, in the mid 1980s. So I've been using her work ever since then. Um, but also Karen Barad's work, who, who obviously um, now fulfills the, um, the very position that Donna Haraway had in the History of Con Consciousness program and was a student of Donna Haraway's. And of course, Karen Barad's work has become really influential in science and technology studies in particular. So I, I include those four feminist materialist scholars under the rubric um, of, of really interesting writers who are writing about embodiment and about, in their case, mostly environmental politics. They don't talk much about digital technologies, but what I've tried to do is bring in their socio-material perspective uh, into an analysis of how we live with and through, goes back to my old interest in how we live with and through our digital devices and also our data. And in fact, another book that I've published recently is called Data Selves, and it, it actually applies this approach to how we understand our, our what I, I call our digital data assemblages. Um, so when, when the COVID pandemic erupted and, and, you know, basically we worldwide, we began to hear about it in early February. And of course, I, I'm very aware that Italy was one of the first countries that was very badly affected by the pandemic. It, it never really has affected Australia. We've been very, very lucky because basically because we're an island continent, we closed our borders and we're still not allowed out. <laughs> we're sort of locked up in this last continent. Um, so very quickly they close the borders, which of course is problematic because it, it does mean that we're very, very isolated and that's very hard for people to come to come in, whether they're Australian citizens or non-Australian citizens at the moment, and we can't get out. Um, but anyway, that's another issue. But um, I, I, I mean, it, 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 once, I mean, I, I, I realised quite early on that the COVID pandemic was going to be very disruptive and it was going to be a you know, pretty much unprecedented event for the world. Just because I'd already had a lot of background in HIV AIDS and other infectious diseases for a long time. So I started writing very quickly about the social aspects of the pandemic. And uh, in the preface of the face mask book, each of us, each of the the four authors of the book, we actually give an account of our everyday experiences of the face mask. And what I say in the preface is I, I, I tell about my experience when I went on a family holiday to Japan with, um, with my, my partner and two children and noticing how many people were wearing a face mask. And I actually felt this is before, this was in sort of late January 2020. So it was Japan was hearing about this new, you know, this new um, infectious disease that was coming out of Wuhan in China, but they, 
they still really weren't really worried about it, nor was most nor were most other countries yet. But um, so they weren't wearing face masks because of COVID. They were wearing face masks because it had already become an acculturated practice in Japan. Basically, since um, the plague years in the early 20th century, actually, where, when Japan was hit by a few waves of the plague. And these days, um, Japanese people wear very, very um, routinely wear face masks um, in winter, particularly. And we were there in their winter um, just to protect against any viral infection, just common cold or flu. I felt, and I noticed it, I noticed, noticed how many people were wearing face masks and as a sociologist I just you know, took notice, oh that's interesting. Um, but I did feel a bit uncomfortable because I felt like any time I was in a crowded train or something and coughed or sneezed and I wasn't wearing a face mask, I felt like maybe I was being a little bit of a, um, you know, deviant. <laughs> maybe they were looking at me and thinking, oh this, you know, this terrible European person who's not doing the right thing. So I did become quite sensitive to the whole issue of face masks. Meantime, I went back to Australia. We came back to Australia and we were having terrible bushfires in Australia at that time, which some of you may remember. It was, a ter it was called the Black Summer. It was our summer, the European winter. And um, we had terrible air pollution. So people actually started wearing masks then to protect against the, ter you know, it actually can really badly affect your lungs if you breathe in all the pollutants in the air, if there's, t there's really bad bushfires near nearby. And you could just see this thick pall of smoke in, in you know, near where, at, when you looked outside the window. So I actually purchased a mask and started wearing it to go outside then. And I noticed some other people were as well. But that was literally the first time I had ever worn a mask, face mask, and any other Australian I had ever seen had worn a face mask. And then COVID struck. <laughs> so that was another context within a few months that the whole issue of face masks began to be talked about in Australia and elsewhere. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm bringing together all those experiences, all those sort of observations, all that training in sociology of health, of embodiment, disease, contagion, infection, epidemics, pandemics. I mean, it just, be, it, you know, it, it just seemed an, an, an obvious thing to write about. So I proposed the book to my team. The other three authors are all, as you mentioned, um, postdoctoral fellows in my Vitalities lab. I thought it would be a great book for us all to work on as a team. And they all do bring um, interesting backgrounds um, in sort of um, creative, uh, cre as you mentioned, Gabriella, um, creative um, writing. Um, Marianne Clark comes actually out of body movement and kinesthetics and then into feminist sort of theory and the body. Um, Claire Southerton is an expert on self tracking and digital devices. So we all, we were able to very easily decide which chapters we were mostly going to lead. I, I sort of, you know, kept a close editorial eye on the whole book and made sure it was all um, written in a similar voice. Um, and I wrote the introduction because I was very easily able to write about the history of face masks and infectious disease because, you know, I have a background in that sort of thing. I wrote the uh, the concluding comments and, and, and added a few things to some of the other chapters. So that's the very long story, I suppose, of the provenance of the book. <laughs> Maybe I, I give the word to, to Marco Viola, who is our uh, special discussant and uh, who worked a lot on the team of uh, Face Mask. He also has uh, recen recently published uh, a very big article about the issue on a Nature uh, review. So Marco, please if you want to join us. Okay, thank you very much. I'm thrilled that you invite uh, Deborah and uh, doubly thrilled that you invited me to comment on uh, her and her co-author's book. It's, uh, uh, it's been a very nice reading. And um, before commenting, I, I want to stress why I'm here. Uh, basically, uh, as I was, uh, I was, uh, I joined Facets, which is a, a project mainly based on semiotics, although I don't come from semiotics. I studied analytic philosophy, but I'm trying to stop, <laughs> and uh, cognitive science. And uh, I was interested in face expressions uh, and in what the, the face communicates 
and how much universality and culturality is there in facial expressions and so on. But then when, uh, I, when uh, the pandemic uh, uh, also became uh, a pandemic of masked faces, it, it reshaped all our uh, visual landscape, I uh, went on doing some uh, social psychology experiment uh, to see how much social information is lost when we put on a face mask. Now, the fact is that, yes, of course, as I'm trying to prove right now, you cannot see the lower part of my face, so the mask prevents you to get some uh, social information from my face. But then, the more I went into uh, social psychology, the more I realized that this is just half of a story. In the lab, you can, uh, of course, you can study how much you lose. I, for instance, here, you, you might not be able to recognize me if you don't see the lower part of my face, but there is another part of the story that needs to be told. Because, for instance, here I'm bargaining part of my uh, personal identity in favor of some social or fashionized uh, identity. It is, I am uh, communicating something more. So, while psychology can tell us what the face masks are. Uh, 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 make us lose in terms of social communication, we need uh, qualitative, semiotic, and or, in this case, social material analysis to, to understand what it gives uh, in addition, because that's, that's way more complicated. And uh, the face mask uh, came to represent many things. There is a cacophony of meanings that is, uh, of course, not exhaustively represented in the book because you cannot grasp all of these it's continuously evolving and the book uh, is uh, probably discounts a bit of a delay because you cannot just publish uh, uh, the book has been uh, has been written uh, quickly and that was meritoriously also from the side of a publisher but of course this pandemic was so fast that it rewrote the meaning of the masks so fast i mean uh, it was probably conceived and written while Donald Trump was still a president and USA was a uh, mostly unmasked continent. And in the meantime, and I might add, fortunately, <laughs> they shift their, 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 uh, their attitude and everything. But still, it, the, the temporal uh, contingency of this book makes it, uh, if possibly, most precious because it's, uh, it's a great, great and multifaceted portrait of several topics. I want to emphasize two topics that Gabriele um, or Bruno, I don't remember, mentioned before that I very much appreciated. And, and if you'd like, I'd like to, to give a, a very brief comment on this. The, the first one is the, the last topic you deal with in the book. And sorry, I'm getting rid of this face mask. <laughs> uh, the face mask, as I said, the face mask does do not only prevent you to see my face, but by putting the face mask, in most countries and in most culture, that is, unless you are a no mask, uh, the face mask means I care. Because most face masks are not uh, uh, the so-called selfish mask. And so people wear a face mask and sometimes even write on face mask, as I, uh, if I remember correctly, is uh, shown in one of your figures, uh, because they care. This is a, a, a nice way to uh, highlight our interconnectedness. And this is a, a fantastic uh, uh, chance, the pandemic, for scholars of uh, health and sociology of health like you to, to, to show how much we are not alone, we are not uh, Leibnizian monads uh, when it comes to our bodies. And, but the second, and um, perhaps even, in, even my favorite part is when you talk about breath. Or it, it's, uh, breathing, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I might be mispronouncing it, but still, <sighs> because uh, this, uh, uh, the face mask is uh, really a litmus test for our interconnectedness, not only with each other, but with the environment. I really much liked, although I was totally unaware of the modern human perspective that uh, illuminates all the book, but uh, it really, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, it, and um, I must, uh, um, I'd like to, to trace uh, um, uh, a link with some perspectives that I know of uh, 
from uh, uh, analytic philosophy of cognitive science. You might have probably heard of uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers' uh, extended mind hypothesis and with the, the trend of leisure to regenerate. While they focus mostly on the cognitive side of our extendedness, several other authors, uh, when we come to Australia, I cannot uh, think about of uh, Kim Sternley, which is more biologically grounded than Clark and Chalmers, stress that we are not alone, that our mind is not a floating uh, a brain in a vat uh, in this world. But, and, uh, and so I, I was aware of the interconnectedness of mind because of this perspective in philosophy of mind. But the nice thing about your book is that it, show, it puts the interconnected brain in an interconnected biological world. That is, we move from the brain to the body and the body is a breathing body and the, the, the breath is never seen uh, in, in normal interactions while it is seen in the night picture you took uh, uh, when it's frozen, but the face mask has been uh, um, has allowed uh, to see and to appreciate the breath, the importance of uh, uh, the porousness, as you repeatedly say, of our body, which is probably easier to understand that the body is not a modern when you are a woman, because we, well, I mean, it's the it's intuitive when we think about maternity, but I don't want to delve into this also because I don't know a thing about it. I'm, I'm really not aware, but uh, the, fa the COVID and the face mask is a really great vantage point. And if I have to summarize the whole book, I'd say that uh, um, the book uh, uh, is not only about face mask, it's about ourselves, the authors, but also ourselves in the pandemic and the face mask offers a privileged, uh, intelligent vantage point to, uh, to, to look the world around it. It's not just about the, very, the mask in itself. The mask might be, at, in some point, an excuse, uh, a, a, a perspective vantage point to look about ourselves, our bodies, our health, our practices, and our social uh, communication. So there are really many uh, stimuli, and uh, I think I will uh, draw on them in my further reflections about it. And uh, well, thanks for first of all, thanks for putting it together. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Um, yes, I, 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 I too think I too think that. Um, that you're right in, in pointing out that the face mask does become symbolic um, and, and does bring together so many things. And I mean, it, it's interesting that we, uh, yes, and the book is a, a shortish book, it's not hugely long, but it, it, it's interesting that we could find so many different perspectives to think about the face mask once we started thinking about it and we were able to to really look at it from, from quite a multi-dimensional perspective. And, one thing we, we do um, emphasise as part of our more than human perspective is is the issue about the about face masks as physical objects as they enter into the environment and while they uh, can be symbolic of, of care of, of others when we wear them they're very obvious symbolic and as you say they're on our faces I mean that, that's the interesting thing about them too is you can't if someone's wearing one or if someone's not wearing one you can't not notice <laughs> you notice their absence you notice their presence because they're on our face and you can't hide that um, usually uh, so um, but what we also try and talk about because we are taking we, we, we're going out from the human into the more than human environment that we argue as part of our theoretical perspective that humans are always already part of more than human worlds um, that we also need to consider the environmental issues of discarded face masks so there, there is a there is a section in our, our chapter about care which is about not just care for humans but care for for other living things and for the for the environment the natural environment and and that's something that's not always mentioned but um, it's it's really quite interesting that there's this perspective in public health called one health that's become quite dominant and it's really, the pandemic itself has become this apotheosis as an exemplar of one health because we see a zoonotic virus passed on from either bats or pangolins, they're still not exactly sure, but we know it's from a wild animal in a wet market probably in China, probably. 
Um, and um, there's so many environmental issues around the way that humans have totally ignored the care for the environment, you know, the way that we treat wildlife, the way that we've uh, intensified farming has treated farmed animals and sort of destroyed environments uh, to grow crops and, and to farm animals. Um, climate change. These are all implicated but within the emergence of new um, infectious diseases such as COVID-19. So um, that's, that's also part of, of, of what we talk about in the book, a really important part of what we talk about in the book. Maybe, if I can, I would like to, to mention, uh, I, I already did it uh, in, in my brief introduction, uh, um, a kind of paradox related to, to the mask, because, of course, uh, this kind of mask uh, have uh, rapidly become uh, a kind of total institution, so everybody in the world in some way experienced the uh, uh, the mask, of course, in Italy, maybe more than in other countries because we we were um, more strongly affected by the pandemic. But anyway, it's it's kind of a common uh, new feature of human beings. And this could be, uh, in some way, imply... A, um, this could imply a kind of rhetoric of a new... Uh, humankind uh, united under this big uh, and uh, umbrella of uh, uh, care of everyone uh, and, uh, and of everything. While in your book you underline how this is not true because uh, also behind uh, this new uh, social uh, dispositive, minorities exist and also this dispositive can become something that minorities can use in order to express themselves. Uh, so not only a sanitary device, but also a political, an artistic, um, a way to express uh, um, ourselves device. So I think this is quite good because, of course, it's sociological, semiotic, it, put toge it puts together all our different perspectives. I don't want, I don't know if you want to to, to say something about it, because I, I think it's really interesting, because uh, otherwise, uh, if we just look at the, at the issue by the common sense, uh, we, we, we can see mask as something we are obliged uh, to put on, it's something compulsory. But there is also a world of possibilities related to masks. We, uh, we want to aesthetize them, we want to uh, put a meaning, a kind of uh, sovereign structural meaning beyond the sanitary one on them. And I think you, in the, in the theoretical path you build in your book, this is quite uh, uh, well explained. So if you want to uh, say something about this, I would be happy to hear you. Thank you. Yes, we, we do have a, a, a chapter about do-it-yourself cultures. Um, and the way that, that the face mask did become very much an aesthetic as well as a hygienic object for some people, not for everyone obviously, but um, this, this vast marketplace emerged um, on Etsy, which is a the on, you know, global online platform for people to sell handmade items. And um, it was really quite fascinating to explore on Etsy um, there was, I mean, I think there was also quite a shortage for a while. I know there was in Australia when uh, people were trying to buy, people wanted to buy reusable face masks. Yes, that's an example of some of the ones I ordered from Etsy. <laughs> As you can see, I like pretty masks. That's part of my aesthetic. <laughs> and I talk about how I, you know, I went for the vintage kind of um, floral fabrics because that's me. I do like a floral fabric. <laughs> Um, and if I'm going to wear them on my face, I like them to be pretty, yes. <laughs> uh, and they were expensive, as I mentioned there. Um, I, I spent hundreds of dollars um, on these, these lovely looking masks. Um, I've got to say, I didn't like wearing them though. Um, I, I still found it hard to breathe in them. Um, but 
they do look nice. And uh, so there's this mat, yeah, there's this vast market on Etsy um, where you can basically buy any kind of a mask with any kind of sort of um, pattern or design on it that you could possibly want for any occasion. So we talk in the book about you know you can buy them for christenings, for bar mitzvahs, for weddings, for funerals, um, in loving memory of you know you can get them with in loving memory of you know whoever has sadly died. Um, but for happy occasions like you know birthdays and uh, so yeah it's really interesting to see how the creative souls in this world the people who like to sew and create objects with fabric very much um, jumped onto this opportunity um, so yeah that was quite interesting and it, it also meant you know if you supported a, a certain football team you could get get them and uh, or a political party and of course, we have seen world leaders often often wear masks that um, have the flag of their nation um, as a very nationalistic symbol. So, so yes, they they're the semiotics of the mask really go beyond. Well, they're doing they're doing two things, aren't they? If you're wearing a mask that um, has a special customized design that you've spent time um, uh, looking for and purchasing, then one is you are doing the hygienic, you're showing, yes, I'm hygienic, I'm going along with the idea that I'm caring for, for my health but also those of others because I'm wearing a mask. But you're also signifying the kinds of things. I mean, I, I came to think of those kinds of masks that did have very personalised messages or patterns as a bit like um, message T-shirts because you know how people, you know, wear T-shirts with political slogans or just um, vintage prints on them or you know brand names their t-shirts have been used for for a long time now to display certain kind of ideas about that you want to display to the world about yourself and in that way masks actually uh, certainly the kinds of masks you get on etsy actually serve that function as well um, so yeah we did spend quite a lot of time looking at those sort of semiotic issues we were also I was I was also interested because I also am a digital sociologist we did we do talk a little bit about um, memes and and pro and anti me, you know memes that were made in support of or um, against face masks um, also interesting for those who are anti face masks they could purchase face masks that were made of lace or a very holy material that obviously weren't functional at all but they put them on to sort of say well you know so what I don't care yes I'm wearing a mask because I'm kind of forced to but I'm wearing a totally invalid mask just to prove that I don't care and I'm against it <laughs> or even the um, face mask that 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 had signs on saying printed on you know I'm only wearing this because I'm forced to so yeah a lot of interesting different signs coming together there Deborah, if you um, wouldn't have uh, um, bring up uh, about uh, the, the memes, I would have uh, asked <laughs> something about <laughs> that because we are really uh, we've been and we are uh, really interested in memes in general. So it's something that we studied a little bit also uh, as regards the pandemic. So how these big uh, big discourse in which we were all everywhere even though in different times thrown together so it's something really powerful that such ephemeral uh, most most often uh, more than often uh, stupid <laughs> things can carry so much meaning about uh, how we uh, position ourselves in the very moment uh, fronting this hyper object which is the virus and the pandemic but <laughs> Since you already addressed the memes, and we invite people to purchase the book and read about them, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would like to ask you something which is as much as fascinating for me, uh, and that it's really linked to the fact that you were talking about this. I would define them using this word that designers like a lot, which is skeuomorphism. So these masks that have no function. So these masks, masks that, are, that are just aesthetical and not working as um, 
uh, health uh, disposal and devices, etc. So, my question is, uh, and I I want to say thank you to Marco uh, because he recently uh, handed us a paper or a newspaper article, something about that, which was talking precisely about the fact that a lot of people are starting. Even so. Uh, Long story short, at the very beginning, we were all afraid about the fact. I, I myself was personally, personally, uh, I felt forced to wear the mask, and then eventually I wore it because we had to. But I remember the very day, and I made a selfie of myself. The very first time I was uh, forced to 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 wear the mask in order to uh, buy some stuff at the grocery store because I could not get in otherwise. It was, I think, uh, really very late in Bologna. Uh, it was April the 19th in 2020, something like that, in which we were forced to wear it um, on the inside of a public store, etc. So it was a kind of, a kind of uh, small, big trauma for the reasons that Bruno was referencing. So the fact that we had to put another piece of our body that we didn't have before onto our body. And obviously embodiment and activism are part of the game. But so at, in the beginning, we were afraid. We didn't want to wear it, even though we were, uh, we were not de definitely, we were not no mask. Okay, so uh, we, was, we were forced. Now we are completely familiarized with such a uh, device. And a lot of people, and even a bit myself personally, are starting to feel kind of naked without them. So, for example, this newspaper article that Marco posted into our uh, private group of research, etc., was about people saying, I feel protected. But in a different way that maybe has something to do also with the gaze, also with a new kind of intimacy, and not being protected in the fashion of what we already know since decades that works in China or Japan. So they wear the mask because of the uh, environment. Actually, also for this kind of intimacy. So, sorry, I'm, I'm talking way too much, but I wanted to, to give you my perspective. And I wanted you to ask, um, uh, sorry, I wanted to ask you uh, if, um, according to your experience, personal and scholarly, you can kind of not do a prevision, not foresee something, but if, <laughs> if you can imagine to, to, to a certain extent, to, a, to some extent, uh, what, what is going to happen to these masks when the emergency, we hope obviously as soon as possible, etc., is about to end? What, what, what's going to happen to this symbol that has generated so many symbols and that we feel uh, uh, equipped with? Well, if I was going to be really pessimistic and depressing, I would say, you know, the experts warn that there will be future pandemics after this one's dealt with. And in fact, experts are also saying that um, we may never fully deal with COVID and it will just keep popping up like seasonal flu. <laughs> so um, if I'm going to be, yeah, just really, really, um, Pessimistic, one could argue that COVID actually won't ever really go away and, and therefore there may well be good reason to, not always, but perhaps wear face masks, at least in some, sometimes, not some, some occasions. I mean, it's really interesting to think about, you probably wouldn't know much about how the pandemic's played out in Australia, but apart from the fact that we haven't been too badly affected. But um, we've also had differences between different regions and um, We've only had one national lockdown, and that was fairly early on last year, but we've had lots of little short lockdowns whenever there's been an outbreak of even one or two cases because we all panic then. Um, and, and often the, the government of each different state uh, in Australia, uh, will the premier of the state will say, right, there's a three-day lockdown. Everyone has to wear masks now, but otherwise they don't have to. So we go back and forth all the time in Australia, actually, and it, it's, but it's really localised. 
So, you know, I, in Sydney, there was a short period of time when mas masks were mandated, but then they've only been mandated once again for a few days for a short lockdown. So we've, we've just gone back and forth a lot in Australia. And in some parts of Australia, they've never been mandated because there were never enough cases to worry about. So yeah, it's really interesting just to compare, even within my own country, the differences in people's experiences of face masks. Um, I do know that a lot of people I know who lived through the second lockdown that we had, which was in the state of Victoria and in the second largest city of Melbourne, um, they had a very long lockdown towards the end of last year or mid to, mid to late last year. And I did, and they, they, they were mandated face masks for a long period of time. And I do remember my colleagues and friends living in that area saying they felt weird not wearing them anymore when they were no longer mandated. They're, no, they're only mandated now, I think, on public transport, but other places they can not wear them if they don't want to. So all this to say is that um, my own experience and my own observations, at least in my own country, is that people seem to quite quickly get used to not wearing them if they don't have to, even when they've had to wear them for a long period of time. Um, Having said that, I have, I, I am, a, I am aware that that other people have enjoyed the anonymity of it. I think I did see that article that you mentioned. Um, young women have talked about liking being able to hide behind the mask and not getting the kind of attention in public that they were getting very sick of, <laughs> for example. So that's another interesting perspective on it. Um, but yes, I guess my answer would be it's complicated and it all depends. You know, it really does depend. I mean, I've lived in, in a place where we've hardly had to wear face masks at all throughout the pandemic. So, you know, we haven't got used to them and I hate wearing them and still haven't got used to them <laughs> just because I haven't had to wear them very often. Um, so I think it will really depend on a whole of factors, how vulnerable someone feels, whether they've been, I mean, the, whole, the big politics now, of course, are about vaccination and risk. It's kind of moved on a little bit from the face mask and now in Australia I know, I'm not sure what it's like in Italy, but we've had terrible troubles rolling out a proper va vaccination program. And so now people post selfies of getting the vax. It's like, oh, I finally got my vax. You know, forget the face mask issue. It's all about the vaccination. So maybe there's another book to be written about the politics of vaccination actually, because that seems to be the next big issue around COVID. <laughs> and and just picking up on something that I think it was Bruno, it could have been Marco, sorry, but one of you mentioned that, um, oh, yeah, I think it was Marco. We talked about, like in the book, we actually start off by talking about President Trump and, you know, how anti-face mask he was. And we recognise that it, that we wrote the book in a certain moment. It's And it's already become like a social history of the first year, the face mask in the first year of COVID. We're now into the second year of COVID and things are changing. And now, as I say, vac I think vaccination politics are now becoming the main issue. So, um, but what I would like to think is that, you know, it's an interesting social history, near, near history of, of the first year of the pandemic and how important face masks were as a political object and not just a hygienic object in that first year and all the controversies. We'll probably look back in a few years and just think, oh, you know, I can't believe all those all those controversies and politics around face masks. You know, usually in a TV series, the sequel is worse uh, uh, than, uh, than the original one. Let, let's hope the sequel of the COVID pandemic uh, will be better than the, than the first uh, edition. And also, thank you for your cautious, prudent uh, answer because uh, it proves that good sociology and good semiotics is not uh, predictive, but uh, it limits uh, mm -hmm. itself in being descriptive. But uh, maybe for the conclusion, I I will give again the the, the floor to Marco. Uh, I, I see also there is a question in the chat, but maybe Marco can. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, thanks. I was just uh, commenting again that that's a very interesting book. It's interesting also uh, uh, the history you mentioned about it, uh, that is in Australia, face mask joined the, the, the party because of the bushfires, not because of the pandemics. And then they were 
re-exploited. And then uh, the nice thing about the material objects, I found this uh, underlined uh, by Beth Preston. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's a philosopher of culture in the U in uh, Anglo-American tradition, but she's trying to smuggle the wisdom of uh, continental philosophy and some feminist philosophy into the stubborn uh, analytic uh, uh, tradition. And she teach, teaches us that um, uh, the material objects kind of have a life on its own. So Phasmus is a great example of that. They were introduced, at least in Australia, for one purpose, then they got repurposed, then people realize that, that you can have floral motifs or whatever on the face mask so they gain a, a, a secondary not technical social sanitary but but uh, design and fashion functions and then there are uh, some consequences when you are uh, hearing impaired that's a nice point if you're planning to go back on a book uh, on face mask which you probably won't because you're right but basin is the next big thing but if anyone wants to come back on that as i'd love to but publisher don't agree with me. You'd really need to address, in my opinion, the history of uh, uh, transparent face mask. Because if I'm hearing impaired and I use uh, lip movements to read whatever uh, uh, people say, I cannot do this with when someone has a face obstructed. So I need face mask like this. This is particularly uncanny and uh, and makes me look like Hannibal Lecter. But this is one prototype <laughs> of face mask which tries to overcome this obstacle. But there is a, a very nice history of care about people donating and doing uh, the, uh, uh, themselves or doing semi-professional, uh, doing a transparent face mask and donating them to people who are in need because the politics and the industry needs more time. So that's that. If you ever plan to do this, so let's keep in touch and let's write a, a nice at least follow up paper about the history of caring for the hearing impaired and how mask politics can become inclusive to to everybody but that's of course that's a, that's a tale for another day for today let me thank you again uh, for this nice conversation and of course for the nice book thank you marco <laughs> Gab gabriella you want to say something uh, for the grand finale <laughs> no, um, uh, I'd say that um, I think this conversation was very stimulating. Um, 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 I, I wanted to point out some specific issues, but uh, for example, uh, some of them were already uh, brought to light by Deborah without being stimulated by my question. So <laughs> I was super satisfied by what she told us. And um, yes, I think that. Uh, since we are living the moment and or the momentum as they say but the momentum is not so great actually uh, i think that uh, um, putting together different perspective I, I i do a kind of ring composition i start from where i, I finish with uh, fr from where we started so my, my idea is that a, a kind of topic uh, like uh, all this stuff that we are constantly talking about and that we cannot get rid of uh, um, on the plane of discourse. So even though when everything is going to be over or it's going to be uh, silenced uh, from the biological and ecological perspective, we, we, we will go on. Um, and, and it's... Um, it's something that we, we are aware and something that it's part of the game. The fact that we are... Uh, about to talk uh, to talk about all of these uh, way uh, way too much and and anyway so much <laughs> for uh, for uh, for a lot of other uh, for a lot of other time so um uh, since so many stuff has been written and maybe a new genre in in scholarly specializations was born the pandemic the virus if you go i think it's the same everywhere but if you go uh, to the um, bookstores here in Italy, in the big uh, chains, uh, like uh, one uh, which is really uh, engagé and uh, uh, cool, uh, which is uh, Feltrinelli, a big one. Um, if you go to Feltrinelli, you find in a lot of um, in a lot of cities the shelf that it's being devoted to um, to this new genre, which is the virus and the pandemic, from the 
uh, fairy tales for the kids that are uh, educational, so you have to wash your hands and so on and so forth, to very specific uh, psychological books and technical books. So what I want to say is that uh, it's really, uh, it's fun in the best way. And for me, the best way of doing uh, research is uh, doing something fun. Uh, but you have to be rigorous, yes, of course. So it, it, it's, it, it was really fun for me today to uh, come to to make a comparison and to to put together different ideas, but they which are converging also because they share a kind of a, a little bit of uh, the very same roots, the very same history on this very topic. So there is one topic at the center, and we can, from our perspectives, trying to do a kind of editing or montage in which every perspective is useful to deal with uh, uh, different aspects of the very same subject. So I won't add anything. I want to say thank you, Deborah, a lot for, for, for joining us. We hope that we were able to uh, make a good uh, publicity <laughs> to the book and that we <laughs> introduced it uh, uh, cleverly as much as we were capable of. So we, we, you, you will tell us uh, about that if we were good uh, uh, introducers and uh, uh, people to to get in touch with uh, and chatting and talking about uh, uh, scholarly and not only scholarly stuff. So I will shut up and I will give again the word to Bruno and to Debra for I don't know a final remark or something like that. And also thank you, Marco, a lot because your your um, your remarks was were really uh, interesting and uh, on point. So thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Well, I, I finish. Uh, I have the honor, honorable role of the master of a ceremony. So I, I show for the last time uh, the cover of the book. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Deborah, but also thank uh, um, Claire Sutherton, Marianne Clark, and Ash Watson. We presented today the face mask in COVID times, a social material analysis, uh, the Greuter uh, 2021. Deborah, Deborah, you you were delicious. Thank you for uh, having accepted our invitation and for your um, exquisite participation today. And uh, we strongly advise the, this book uh, uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a wide uh, uh, range of audiences, uh, not only sociologists, not only semioticians, but also not strictly academic people interested in this uh, strange but nowadays common thing that is uh, face mask. For all the other uh, people interested in our strange stuff, we see uh, you next week with another episode of Semi Boomer. So thank you, Deborah, and thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was great.